accomplish for, um, for Judaism, the Jewish people, when you actually have a lot of people in one place is very powerful. Um, so I'm going to go until uh, 10.45 rather than 10.30. I'm going to cut your break by 15 minutes because we had a longer leisurely entry in this morning and I want to have the time to, to really play this out. Our topic for today uh, is um, the very provocative title, Auschwitz or Sinai. Uh, and I, I want to just acknowledge from the outset, it's not a title I invented. Um, of course, it's the title of a really important essay um, by David Hartman, which is actually the first source in your source book, which we're not going to read closely, but you'll have an opportunity to take with you and read. Um, there, is a, there was an earlier version of this that's actually in your binders, which afterwards you can give back to us and we'll recycle, but this is the, the, the yellow version is the one I want to do. Uh, Auschwitz or Sinai was an article written by David Hartman. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's, it's, it's not in the reprint, but the technical title of the article is Auschwitz or Sinai in the Aftermath of the Israeli-Lebanese War, an article written by David in 1983 um, in the wake of a war that perhaps more than any other uh, rattled uh, the Israeli consciousness about um, not just uh, vulnerability, which had already been introduced to the Israeli consciousness in a very powerful way in 1973 with the Yom Kippur War, but also about the question of the morality of Israel's power and how it wanted to exercise its power. I don't want to get too far into to the biographical background here, but a big piece of um, what made for such a reflective moment in David's own theology was the fact that his son-in-law was, was killed in the Israeli-Lebanon War. Um, our program that we do here at the Machon that, te that brings in 1,500 uh, Israeli army officers a year to study at the Hartman Institute Ju issues of Jewish ethics and morality of war, and Leva Haron, is named for David's son-in-law, uh, Arla. Uh, and so it's very clear that uh, this war not only had a powerful uh, resonant effect on the Israeli consciousness, but it also took a deeply personal toll on David Hartman. Uh, and the result was this powerful and reflective essay in which David essentially was asking, and what we're going to try to dig into, by which paradigm of the Jewish past, Auschwitz or Sinai, uh, do we understand our responsibility in terms of state building in the present? And very simply, do we think about Auschwitz and Jewish victimhood and vulnerability as the defining archetype, the defining paradigm that, uh, that we use to build a state? And we'll play this out more fully, but in that paradigm, we focus on our own victimhood. We, we lose agency in essence, right? We are essentially victims and vulnerable, and therefore we kind of, we're exempt of um, ethical responsibility because our whole motive is fundamentally to survive? Or do we focus on a paradigm of Sinai, which is one entirely in the realm of aspiration, of commandedness, of obligation, in which we are completely agents ourselves of the kind of state that we want to create and that we want to build. What makes this article and this story a little bit of anomaly in David Hartman's work is that, and I think we, some of you may have studied this already, although David Hartman's uh, theology in large part responds to um, it is, is, is very much revolves around and has as a key element the modern state of Israel. You know this from how the Machon is built. You know this that when we do evening programs about the state of contemporary Jewry, we do that not because it's a distraction from the real work of studying Judaism, but because these are moments to be interpreted. And last night, it, that includes American Judaism, but oftentimes is a focus on Israeli Judaism. These are, th this is a moment for us to actually figure out who as Jews we want to be in the world, and that's born um, largely out of David's teaching. At the same time, a lot of his theology was premised on not wanting to draw a direct historical link between what happened to us and therefore an interpretation of God's work in the world. Right? In, in God Who Hates Lies, he writes this very explicitly on the difference between what he calls the ethics of description versus the ethics of response. I, can, I don't, I don't want to say, simply because there was 1948 and 1967, that therefore God is acting in the world, and that therefore compels me religiously to act in a particular way. David tried to separate out very explicitly, I can interpret God's role in the world, but my response has to come as a human response, rather than as a direct interpretation of what God is trying to tell me to do. It was that attempt to resist the reading of history which makes us into fundamentalists. And for those of you who are here 
here last summer, that's what we talked about a lot um, in my class last summer. Um, how do you read history in a way that becomes theologically commanding without falling into the trap of being a fundamentalist? So what's unusual about this uh, Auschwitz or Sinai moment is that it is very much locked in to a particular historical moment that David sees as ripe for interpretation, and yet at the same time he wants us, and I think he's right, to resist the notion that just because I'm interpreting a historical moment, it doesn't command me to act in a certain way. I have to voluntarily decide to situate myself in that story and figure out how I want to behave. What I want to do today um, is to think through what these paradigms fundamentally mean, right? Not just to throw around this terminology of Auschwitz or Sinai, but to really dwell in what do we mean when we talk about a paradigm of Auschwitz that informs our consciousness of what it means to build a state of Israel. And here, to acknowledge that these are not merely paradigms, but they are almost instincts in the Jewish tradition. And to look at the sources that help to animate that it's not just a particular historical moment of Auschwitz, but it is almost like an, a, a Jewish instinct to think in a certain way about victimhood and vulnerability, and to think about what that means means for the state of Israel we want to imagine that we want to create. And the same is true on the Sinai paradigm. It's not just a moment in Jewish historical time, but it is an instinct in the Jewish consciousness to think in a Sinai moment. And I want to look much more closely at the sources in our tradition that animate the Auschwitz story and that animate the Sinai story to try to investigate um, both, both what they mean. I want to then punch holes in both of them and talk about why both of them are actually fundamentally limiting. And and in this respect, I want to go a little bit beyond what David did with his paradigm. When, the, the, when he asks the question, Auschwitz or Sinai, it is a rhetorical question, right? The obvious answer is Sinai, right? He is resisting the, the defaulting to Jewish vulnerability and wants us to be a people of Sinai rather than a people of Auschwitz. I, I think 30 years later, that needs to, be, needs to be a little bit rethought. And I want to ultimately conclude by trying to posit a way in which we imagine ourselves as people of both Auschwitz or Sinai. That we need not come out on one side or the other, that both of these bring something to the table and both are fundamentally limiting, but that a true deep Jewish consciousness that takes our past very seriously, even if it doesn't command us in very specific ways to act in the present, that both of those instincts need to be alive and well in the Jewish consciousness. Um, ultimately, um, and this is I think the very simple takeaway, how we think about our past uh, directly informs what we think about our future, and more importantly, compels us to act in very particular ways. So in 2013, rather than 1982, re-asking the question of Auschwitz or Sinai is, I think, of critical importance. I want to make one um, very small caveat. Auschwitz, in this terminology, um, is not Auschwitz, <laughs> right? And I think, it's, I think in 1982, the phrase Auschwitz means something very different in, in, in 2013. In 1982, living in a world in which there were many survivors and the anxiety was not yet as, the, as it is today, are people going to forget actual Auschwitz? That's going to be a feature of what we're going to talk about. When we live at a time in which there are many fewer survivors around who actually remember the Auschwitz experience, there are different anxieties about what it means to talk about Auschwitz as a typology, as a paradigm. And and we want to acknowledge that. And I also want to just be respectful that the terminology of Auschwitz, even if I'm using it in a way today that is a paradigm and an instinct, is also a real catastrophic place in the relatively recent past of the Jewish people. And I think that's just, I want to put it on the side because I don't want to be disrespectful in, in punching a hole in Auschwitz as a piece of the Jewish consciousness. I don't want to be disrespectful of the fact that Auschwitz is a real place to many Jews who are still alive today, who are still suffering with an actual memory that they may not be so capable of turning into a paradigm. Okay, um, so let's talk first about Auschwitz, and, and I want you to turn to your sources. We're going to look at essentially two sources to try to understand what it is that we mean when we talk about Auschwitz as a paradigm or an instinct um, of Jewish history that directly informs who we are in the world and how we see ourselves. And the first I want to look at is um, one of the uh, powerful moments in the book of Genesis of the encounter between, metaphorically, the Jew and the other. <coughs> 
And this is the moment when um, Jacob, having been estranged from his brother Esau for, you know, for quite some time, and if you remember, uh, they were estranged for reasons that were mostly Jacob's fault, right? He had, um, you know, before birthright became a trip, it was a piece of that story. <laughs> It'd be very interesting to do a little midrash on how we took the language of birthright from something that Jacob stole from Esau and turned it into a trip to Israel. <laughs> very, very tricky. Um, um, but there's, a, there's this moment of encounter between Jacob and Esau generations later when they, um, when, as you remember, Jacob does not know, um, in fact, lives in profound fear of what's actually going to happen when he re-encounters his brother who is now, um, like him, become a nation, a small nation with a lot of wives and a lot of children and a lot of family. And what's going to happen? And the verses that preceded is that suggest that Jacob was, um, it says very provocatively, Jacob was fearful and he was scared. And the rabbis ask, why would it repeat that word? Why would it say he was both fearful and scared? Because, and the rabbis beautifully expound, he was scared of what Esau was going to do to him. And he was scared and he was fearful of what he was going to do to Esau. In other words, there's a profound dance here of power and powerlessness in this mysterious encounter with the other. And as we'll see in the rabbis, Jacob and Esau become metaphors not just for these individual characters, these patriarchs of the Hebrew Bible, but they are metaphor for the Jew and the non-Jew. And this text that we're going to see in Rashi on the Midrash is actually um, almost symbolically a piece of the story of how Jews and non-Jews -Jew have classically related to non-Jews and particularly non-Jews who they see as a threatening other. And the verse says... Even after all of this emotional buildup, which I don't have for you here, but the emotional buildup of Jacob about to encounter Esau, and Esau ran to him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. They have this beautiful, profound encounter where it almost seems with the weeping and the embracing that they had both had this profound amount of emotional energy building up to the encounter that is ultimately released in the encounter that they have with one another. There is, there is very little to suggest in the actual text itself anything hostile taking place in this encounter. If anything, it is, well, I was nervous beforehand, but ultimately I had nothing to be scared of. And yet, Rashi says as follows. Um, in the Hebrew verses themselves is very strange um, punctuation in the, in the scroll of the Torah itself of a series of dots that are, um, print, that are in the Torah scroll on top of this, which if you're a rabbi trying to interpret the Bible and you believe that every single jot and tittle in the Hebrew Bible must have significance, therefore having some weird punctuation on top of the Bible suggests that something is askew, something is afoot. In other words, this must be interpreted to mean that there's something else going on here that we don't fully understand. And he says as follows, um, there are dots over the word, and there's controversy concerning this matter in a bright of Sifrei and a rabbinic midrash. Some interpret the dots to mean he did not kiss him wholeheartedly. Why is there some weird punctuation taking place here? Because although he kissed him, he wasn't really kissing him. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai said, it is a well-known tradition that Esau hated Jacob. And I want to, if you, if you can look at, for those of you who know the Hebrew, it's not hated Jacob, it's She'esav soneh liyaakov. Esau hates Jacob. That there is actually, well, what's the implication of when I say, not that just that Esau hated Jacob, but that Esau hates Jacob? I'm suggesting that this is an existential description of Esau vis-a-vis -vis Jacob. This is not that one brother late in time hated us, but what? We fundamentally live in a, in a, in a, sta in a state of existence in which the non-Jew hates the Jew. We are always hated. Esav Sonel Yaakov. But his compassion was moved at that time, and he kissed him wholeheartedly. Right? This is not simply a particular feud in time which was resolved. This is a life feud, a lifeblood feud. One of the core ideas that exists in Jewish tradition, which is expressed by Esav Sonel Yaakov, that Esau hates Jacob, is the notion that we live fundamentally with the sensibility that they hate us. And what's extraordinary about this phraseology is that this becomes the mechanism by which Jews hate non-Jews, but it is phrased passively. <laughs> The rabbis don't say, we have as part of our tradition a basic fear, hate, and distrust of the other. What they say is, 
We live in a basic fear, um, distrust, and hate that is from them to us. We are always the vulnerable, we are always the feared, um, and we are always the ones who are hated. Now, we we'll want to play this out a little bit. What consciousness does this create if you are going to build your own sovereign state of affairs is the core assumption that they fundamentally hate us, we are always fundamentally vulnerable, and our society is built, is predicated on a notion of, the, of otherness. We can never be the same as them. Uh, what, what I think, just as a historical note, <clears throat> by the time we read this rabbinic midrash, Esav and Yaakov have also become metaphors for the Jewish people and Rome, and gradually Esav and Yaakov become metaphors for the Jewish people and Christianity. Esau, this is a, a, a very important and a little bit strange historical story, because remember, Esau is born first. <laughs> Nevertheless, the rabbis, through a lot of intellectual gymnastics, make Esau and Jacob the story of the Jewish people and Christianity, even though in that narrative, Christianity winds up being born first. That's for a different summer and a different time, right? What does that actually mean? At minimum, it's, the rabbis are willing to suggest that Jews and Christians, or Jews and the Roman Empire, are actually born, um, we have family links. We're born of the same mother. We're children of the same mother. Even if in the same midrash, even though we're children of the same mother, we still have a fundamental despising of one another which as you recall from the birth of Jacob and Esau, goes back even to when they were in their mother's womb and they were frolicking, or perhaps as the rabbis like to imagine, fighting. That they were pulled um, in utero to two different instincts. One idea, which is expressed here in this midrash, um, and I, 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 wanna, I, I don't want to underemphasize how important this ideology is in, I think, the life of many Jews since this has been written and to today, that fundamentally, Esav Sonel Yaakov, that nothing we can do as Jews can overcome the basic fear, distrust, and hate that the Goyim have to us. Right? And all of the terminology that we as Jews come up with to describe everybody else, even the language of Goyim, betrays a sensibility that we are alone in the world. Right? I think Daniel may have mentioned this, but I'll make it even clearer. You know, Israelis think of the, think, have two ways, you divide the world into two ways. There's here and chutz la'aretz. It's an amazing psychological condition that would describe the world as a small plot of land the size of New Jersey, which is the world, and everything else that's out there. The same way that we oftentimes, as Jews, describe between Jews and non-Jews, as though they are an other and we are the us. It becomes most pernicious in an ideology which suggests not only are we us and they them, but they fundamentally hate us. And that doesn't therefore create any ethical obligations on us as a people to amount any argument for ourselves. All we have to do is be hated by them in order to have some sort of significant self-identity. And this was obviously what part of what Ed was talking about last night. Right? As long as they hate us, it frees us of any obligation or sensibility of what it is that we have to do in the world. It's true both for Jews in America and Jews in the state of Israel. The, the, the clearest um, version of this as a vision of Jewish sovereignty um, is the paradoxically nasty prophecy that Bilam issues about the Jewish people in, the scheme, in a scheme in which he, the Bible imagines that he's actually praising the Jewish people. There's this weird moment in the book of Numbers, which we just read in, in synagogue last week or the week before, can't keep track, um, in which even though the whole story of the Bible is the Israelites going through the desert and it's told with the camera angle entirely focused on the Jewish people, you have this weird moment in the book of Numbers when the camera angle changes and it becomes the story of the Jewish people is told through the lens of one of the foreign kings whose lands they are passing through, Balak. And Balak calls on this prophet, Bilam, to curse the Jewish people. And there's a whole affair with the donkey. And after that unfolds, he winds up trying to say curses and ultimately praising and blessing the Jewish people. Balak becomes infuriated. He leaves. Bilam goes back in his way. And the camera angle resumes to be the story of the Jewish people. One of those curses, which turns out to be a praise, is an extremely strange phrase, which I think articulates a vision of Jewish life or a vision of Jewish sovereignty very consistent with this idea of Esau hating Jacob, as it says as follows. 
He took up his discourse. He thinks he's about to curse them. And he says, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east, saying, come curse Jacob for me and come defy Israel. How shall I curse he whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy he whom the Lord has not defied? Right. So now we already get a suggestion. This isn't going to play out as Balak has hoped, as he's contracted him to do. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Um, lo, right, and he says, um, uh, ta, 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 Hain am levadad yishkon, uvagoyim lo yitchashav. Lo, it is a people that will live alone. Am levadad yishkon, and will not be counted among the rest of the nations. It's a very shocking, surprising move that says that part of what it means to praise the Jewish people is to celebrate their loneliness. And not just their, not their political loneliness, because it doesn't mean they will be the only people left on the earth. There are other nations, but they will have a fundamentally lonely existence of otherness to everybody else. They will not be counted among the rest of the nations of the world. And this phrase, am levadad yishkon, becomes almost like a companion to the idea of Esav hates Jacob. Right? Our vision of sovereignty is a vision of existential loneliness, which is governed by the hatred that they have of us. And what does that impel us to do? Is there anything ethical that underlies what it means to do this life? No. The fundamental ethic that is articulated here is one of survival and existential difference from the nations of the world. There is. Um, this ideology is best ex exemplified in contemporary Israeli discourse by the subject of our um, first video. On the way over here, my wife and I stopped in New York. We went to a restaurant. A man walks up to our table. boy, 12 years old. He says, this is my son. He's really excited to see him. Can you give him a one word sentence to take to his classmates in social studies? That's what he said. I looked at that boy and I said, Why do you want this sentence? And he said, because I'm interested in the future of the world. Oh, what happened? That's not the good part. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> interested in the future of the world. So I said, okay, here's the sentence. It's 1938 and Iran is Germany. It's 1938 and Iran is Germany and it's racing to arm itself with atomic bombs. I don't know if that boy understood me. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Because there are many people who will tell you otherwise. Maybe some even in this conference, they'll tell you it's not like that. It's not as bad. It's that. <laughs> About a year ago. It's 1938 and Iran is Germany. This is the message delivered by the Prime Minister of Israel to the GA, the General Assembly, which I mentioned last night of Jewish Federations of North America, as the primary message that he would want to share with a 12-year-old boy about the, about the state of Israel. 
right? 12 year old boy comes over to him, what should I tell my classmates in social studies? And the prime minister says, it's an unbelievable rhetorical line. <laughs> it's 1938 and Iran is Germany. Uh, Netanyahu is um, the most Holocaust-oriented prime minister that the State of Israel has, has since Begin. And I make that, I make that connection because I think it's important. Begin um, is thought of uh, in Israeli history as the, the Israeli conscience of the Israeli survivor generation and the first prime minister to kind of give voice uh, politically to a survivor generation that was mostly kept quiet in this country out of a sense largely of embarrassment in Israel that the survivors reflected a kind of failure that that Zionism was meant to correct. Begin, part of his, uh, the, the Begin revolution in the late 70s was actually a retrieval of the voice of, Israel, of Holocaust survivors, not as um, moral failures of the Jewish people, to, of their inability to survive, but as um, moral markers of, the, of this consciousness, this Auschwitz consciousness, that part of what we hold in our history is, uh, is martyred up and this sense of loss. It also might be worth unpacking Netanyahu's biography as the son of a Jewish medieval historian who comes from what's called the lacrimose um, narrative of Jewish history, that we are fundamentally um, the vulnerable people of history and therefore Zionism comes to fix that problem. Nevertheless, Netanyahu's ideology is expressed in this really unbelievable clip. It's 1938 and Iran is Germany is not that Auschwitz makes a particular moral claim on the Israeli society or state that we want to build. There is only one moral claim that comes out of an argument that says it's 1938 and Iran is Germany, and that is the ethic of survival. And I don't want to, I don't want to underplay the meaning of an ethic of survival. An ethic of survival is profound and it's significant and we'll come back to it, but it is not the same moral claim that suggests what are our responsibilities in the work of statecraft, what society do we want to have any more than it asks the question, what do we have to do in order to survive? I want to say one little footnote on this. Uh, some of you may remember when Obama went to Cairo and gave his now famous Cairo speech, which was his first conversation, public conversation with the Arab world. The feature of the Cairo speech that made most Israelis crazy, and my colleague here at the Institute, Yessi Klein Alevi, wrote a piece that's worth reading called How to Speak Israeli, tried to express why the Obama speech was so frustrating to him, was that the primary motivation that Obama described for why the Arab states need to reconcile themselves to the state of Israel was because, because of the Holocaust. You know, and to Israelis, that was tone deaf and insulting. How dare the President of the United States make the Holocaust the primary narrative of the, of the state of Israel for the Jewish people when there is a totally different narrative about Jewish self-determination, about state building, about statecraft, and then the morality of seeking a ideal Jewish society. But it's, un, it's really interesting. Netanyahu, ironically, is not held to the same standard as the American president in the, in the ability to talk about this 1938 and Iran is Germany. Netanyahu was never um, grilled the same way that Obama was. And what's particularly strange about it, and I don't want to unpack it fully here, is that Netanyahu's address is in English to the American Jewish community. A part of the reason why people are not scandalized by it is that we in the American Jewish community, and this was part of Ed Feinstein's talk last night, are still operating with a vision of the state of Israel that needs Netanyahu's articulation of its 1938 and Iran is Germany, even if Israelis themselves have become more and more allergic to that comment. What's the implication of this being a speech given in English to Americans as opposed to Obama's speech being delivered um, in the Middle East itself? Auschwitz then is an ideology of, of, um, of isolation, of fear, and of suspicion. Right? Since these catastrophes have befallen us, and more importantly, almost independent of the catastrophes that befall us, we live with a core fear and assumption of the other, of the non-Jew. We translate that into an ideology of a state, which is one of isolation, um, and it turns into a public policy tool, which becomes one where we don't self-evaluate. We don't do the cheshbon nefesh kind of examining what is it, what we're about. We simply um, we try to amount a kind of culture of just survival for survival's sake. I want to move to Sinai, 
and after that I'll take a couple of questions and comments. The Sinai ideology, of course, is the total opposite. Right? Sinai ideology says, independent of wh where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the nations of the world, the primary question we ask is what are our responsibilities to ourselves as a people, our responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis God, and what's, this, what's the ideal aspirational society that we want to create? The best articulation of this comes in Exodus 19, and it's significant that the promise of revelation to the Jewish people and the promise that you will be a great nation, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, transpires before the Torah is given. Many of the best promises that get given to the Jewish people are done before they actually get the reward on the other end. A great example of this is you, you paint your doorposts in Egypt as a marker of belonging to the Jewish people before, as an act of faith, of believing that God will then come down and save you. There's no kunz to painting your doorposts once you've already been pulled out. You have to make the commitment to the aspiration before you actually get the reward on the other end. Exodus 19 is an amazing um, series of paragraphs that ties, that makes the kingdom of priests a commitment to a social responsibility. Right, as you see, um, Moses went up to God in verse 3, Lord called him from the mountain saying, Thus say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you've seen what I've done to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be my own treasure among all peoples, for all the earth of my, is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I had a famous verse, which is oftentimes used to describe a language of chosenness, and I think classically misunderstood. If you will live up to my covenant, I will make you a kingdom of priests. What's a kingdom of priests? What do priests do? They sacrifice. They serve. They're an intermediary. They're an intermediary, but they're, what they really are is, in essence, the servant class of the Jewish people. They don't own, their, they don't own any land. They do something on behalf of the rest of the people. They live out the sacrificial processes. They live off of other people. They essentially serve the rest. A kingdom of priests is a, is a mission of responsibility. It is not a gift of chosenness. I'm going to make you special. It's you're going to do something for me in the world. If this becomes the vision of what the Jewish people are meant to be, it is obviously a... Um, a, a promise that requires something of us. This is why David Hartman focuses on Sinai. The moment of Sinai is a commitment to do something profound for the other nations of the world, for the world, and for God. Covenant becomes the model through which we take something on for ourselves, not the model by which we become saved from the other nations of the world. This is why the rabbis imagine, as you see in the rest of the, of the verses here, that the mountain becomes invested with holiness. The cloud of the heavens comes down. The mountain becomes the symbol of a marriage canopy between God and the Jewish people, where outside, specifically outside the land of Israel, Right? The promise is, let's do something great together. Let's unite the Jewish people and God in a shared mission, a shared sense of responsibility, of covenant, loyalty, and obligation. That's why this is such an intriguing metaphor to play out um, what we imagine the state of Israel is supposed to mean. I'm going to skip over the Deuteronomy pieces. Um, but, I, but I want you to look quickly at, um, at source uh, 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 the, the, the peace from a living covenant. One second. It's on page 13. If you look at the sixth line from the bottom, David writes as follows. I give preference to the Midrashim that imply that the covenant was made in the desert to teach the community that Judaism was a way, as a way of life was not exclusively a function of political sovereignty. We were born as a people within the desert in order to understand that the land must always be perceived as instrumental and never as an absolute value. 
I'm not granted the land in the sense that Bilam talks about of in order to be able to live alone, in order to kind of just prioritize my own exclusivity and my own survival. We are given this vision of promise of covenant in the desert in order to imply that it's not about the land. It's about what it is that we do to live in relationship with God. And what I skipped over in terms of Deuteronomy, and there's so many other sources on this, is if you fail to live up to what you're supposed to do as the Jewish people within the land of Israel, what happens to you? It's not either the land is taken away or more perversely, the land actually spits you out, according to the book of Leviticus. The failure to live up to covenant ultimately doesn't allow you to rely on a notion of simply survival. Right? It's not just about being kept apart um, to live apart from the goyim. In, in this respect, David Hartman is so opposite to his classic interlocutor, um, Yeshaya Leibovitch, for whom, what is sovereignty to Yeshaya Leibovitch? The right to live apart, the right to not be killed by the goyim. That's a paraphrase of Leibovitch. It's, it's only the right, it's only the moral stance of survival, right, that enables the paradigm of Auschwitz to create a vision for Jewish sovereignty. This, the sovereignty for, for the David Hartman model of Sinai is totally conditional on how it is that we live in relationship with God, our covenant, and our responsibilities. So I get given the Torah at Sinai in this shroud of holiness, in this marriage canopy between God and the people of Israel, as a, com as a signal of a commitment of what we undertake to do. Should we fail to do that, right, sovereignty is not simply an outcome that we get, it is, is a commitment that we make. Now before I punch some holes in this, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show one small other clip, which I think reflects the closest version that we've had in recent years to a vision of Israel as Sinai. <laughs> and it's not surprisingly comes out um, in the Knesset by a former student of David Hartman. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The text of it, hmm? Ruth. Ruth Calderon, the text of it, of her inaugural speech in the Knesset is on page 16 through 19, but I think it's more powerful to actually hear it articulated um, by, uh, by a visionary voice of what Sinai is meant to be for the Jewish people and is the model for the state of Israel. עכשיו אנחנו צריכים לדמיין, יושב על רחומי ואשתו, רגע, למקום הזה ולעבודה שלי כאן. ראשית אני לומדת שמי ששוכח שיושב על כתפי האחר, ייפול. אני מתחברת לדבריך, חבר הכנסת בנט. אני לומדת שצדיקות היא לא דבקות בתורה על חשבון רגישות לאדם. אני לומדת שבמחלוקת יש לא פעם שני צדדים צודקים ועד שלא אבין שגם אני וגם הצד השני, גם האישה וגם רב רחומי מרגישים שהם עושים את הדבר הנכון והם אחראים לבית הרבה פעמים אנחנו מרגישים האישה שמחכה והולכת לצבא ועושה את העבודה ואחרים על הגג לומדים תורה ופעמים האנשים האחרים מרגישים שהם נושאים את כל מסע המסורת והתרבות והתורה על גבם ואנחנו הולכים לים ועושים חיים. גם אני וגם הצד השני מרגישים שעל כתפיהם כל האחריות לבית. עד שלא אבין את זה לא אראה את הבעיה נכוחה ולא אוכל למצוא פתרון. אני מזמינה את כולנו לשנים של עשייה מתוך מחשבה ומחלוקת מתוך הבנה וכבוד לאחר. אני שואפת להביא למצב בו לימוד התורה יהיה נחלת כל ישראל, מבחינת תורה מונחת בקרן זווית, וכל מי שרוצה ליטול יבוא וייטול. שכל אזרחי ישראל הצעירים ייקחו חלק בנטל גם בלימוד תורה וגם בשירות צבאי ואזרחי וביחד ייבנה הבית ולא תיחלש הדעת. אני שואפת ליום בו משאבי המדינה יחולקו בהוגנות ובשוויון לכל תלמיד ותלמידת חכמים על פי איכות לימודם ולא על פי שיוכם הציבורי שבתי המדרש, הארגונים והישיבות החילוניות והפלורליסטיות יזכו לתמיכה שווה והוגנת מול בתי המדרש האורתודוקסיים והחרדיים ומתוך קנאת הסופרים והתחרות הבריאה תגדל התורה ותאדיר אני מבקשת להזכיר את מורי הרב דוד ארטמן שהלך לעולמו השבוע שפתח לי את שערי בית המדרש שלו ובנה שפה של יהדות אמיצה ומכילה יהי זכרו ברוך אני מבקש לסיים בתפילה שכתב חברי חיים היימס, תפילה בכניסה לכנסת. יהי רצון מלפניך, אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו ואמותינו, 
שאצא מהבית הזה כפי שנכנסתי אליו, שלמה עם עצמי ועם הבריות. מי ייתן שמעשיי יהיו לטובת כל תושבי מדינת ישראל, ושאפעל לתקן את החברה אשר שלחה אותי למעון זה, ולהשכין שלום צודק בינינו ועם שכנינו. מי ייתן ותמיד אזכור שאני שליחת ציבור, ועליי להקפיד על ניקיון כפיים ולב. מי ייתן ואצליח ונצליח בכל מעשה ידינו. ואני מוסיפה ברכה קטנה לסיעה שלי, יש עתיד. Actually, that's less than I thought. Um, as you saw, if you were unable to follow in the English, we focused on the last couple of paragraphs of Calderon's speech, which, and let's just do a, an unfair comparison between the two videos which I've arbitrarily selected. Um, <laughs> one is in English spoken to an American audience and one is Hebrew spoken to an Israeli audience. One is, and this I'm really not gonna unpack today, but I think it's there, one is highly masculinized and one is highly feminized, um, right? There is something, then one is very explicitly a language of Auschwitz, it's 1938, and Iran is Germany, and Ruth Calderon's language of this is our responsibility, this is our covenant, this is our obligation, and therefore I take on, and she self-identifies, I think, incorrectly as a secular Jew, right? Um, she's playing on that notion that secularism is still something that is totally opposite or oppositional to religion. Um, but she is actually a, a profoundly learned Jew who has a PhD in Talmud, um, fought through as a secular woman, the Talmud department at Hebrew University, which as it is, is hard for an Orthodox man to get through, much less a secular woman, um, created institutions of Jewish learning around this country, was a resident of this Beit Midrash for some time, and acknowledges, and to me it's not insignificant, that after giving this talk on what it means to um, to create scholarly envy and glorious competition among Torah scholars for the purpose of the Jewish people of reallocating the sense of social responsibility between civil service and Torah study that she then invokes her teacher, David Hartman. And the prayer that she gives in the Knesset, which is astonishing prayer, which is a prayer of what is my responsibility to do? Right? Not a prayer of, I want um, to be protected. It's not a prayer that locates God's power outside of me, but it's a prayer of what, are my, what it will mean for me to live up to my covenantal obligations as a, as a citizen of the state. Now, Calderon does not say, right, if I don't do this, I'm not deserving to be here, but it's in essence implicit. What it means for Calderon as a, as a reader of the Sinai paradigm of the instinct in Jewish tradition is that, that the state of Israel creates an opportunity for us to live up to the best of Jewish tradition and to imagine a state. This is exactly, right, the full articulation of what David imagines as the, the flip paradigm of Auschwitz or Sinai. I'm not here as a resident of the state merely to avoid detection by the Goyim, merely to be able to construct a counter narrative to them trying to kill me. I'm here to do something, and if I don't do it, I'm not living up to my social responsibility. This is why someone who has spent their life in a Beit Midrash runs for the Knesset. Right? It signals a, I'm, I'm supposed to do something. I am supposed to be part of this social order, and I'm supposed to bring my reading of Talmud to kind of help define the social fabric of a society, even as, as you hear, there is something fundamentally usefully subversive about the way she is thinking about the relationship between that Talmud and the society that she's trying to create. Let me pause and take a couple of questions and comments, and then I want to do neither. I want to critique why neither Sinai works nor Auschwitz works, and then I want I want to try to do both. Yeah, Wes. In, in your presentation of Auschwitz, you know, there's the, the, clearly the implicit critique that we're, that we're here for more than, than, than mere survival. Um, but uh, I keep thinking about the paranoid person who is sometimes right. And when you think about the United Nations resolutions and how despite all the well-known problems with North Korea, et cetera, et cetera, all the horrible regimes, star et cetera, et cetera, 99% uh, whether literally or metaphorically of the human rights kind of nations are Israel, Israel. Israel, 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 it actually makes you think that the paranoid person is right and that they actually really do hate us and we really are alone. So could you talk about how to get out of Auschwitz when the Auschwitz critique may actually Right, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't chasing you, right? Um, right, the, the, I want, so this is I think the key question, Wes, because the different, there's a difference between what you use to describe your existential condition of the world and what becomes the marker of your sense of responsibility. Right, just because that is happening to you does not necessarily become the marker of how you have to behave in the world. 
It's not an easy thing to do, right? I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting it's an easy thing to do, but does, does one have to necessarily pre, does one description necessarily de determine the way you behave? Yeah, and it just. So this is actually the interest, one of the interesting, um, just, Right, so the, he's asking the question of even if, um, even if I shouldn't be paranoid, do, aren't there good indications of reasons I should be paranoid, right? Um, right, and the UN is a good example. Right, so here's an interesting moment that we live in as the Jewish people in, in Israel and America, which is what is the basic l interpretive lesson of the Holocaust? The American Jewish community, I don't want to paint too broad of a stroke, but it does tell a story, um, has in many respects, in many public ways, interpreted the lesson of the Holocaust about Jewish vulnerability vulnerability and victimhood as what is our responsibility to help others not fall into that condition of vulnerability and victimhood. And for many Israelis, and Netanyahu is the, is the exemplar, the lesson of the Holocaust is that this never happened to us again. And these are totally two totally radically different and interpretively correct interpretations of the same data. If you have been subject to profound persecution, what is your ethical responsibility? Is your primary ethical responsibility to not be persecuted by the goyim? And that will determine the state that you then create when you have the opportunity to do it. Or is your primary ethical responsibility, having been the victim and the vulnerable, to make sure that others are not the victim and vulnerable again? But those, those are unbelievably interesting and different choices, which then animate a different vision of the state that you're trying to create. Yeah, Eleanor. It's okay. A little bit. Um, you really have to speak louder. Stand up. Sorry. Yeah, why don't you stand up? Oh. Um, with respect to the clip that you showed of Netanyahu, I think that that was um, very edit edited in that um, you were trying to make a point, but there's no getting away from the fact that there is a threat from Iran. There's nobody that doesn't think that there is a. <clears throat> I was very moved by Ruth Calderon, but I really want to make sure that the defense um, of, of ministry is really very much on top of defense of is the state. And I don't think that Netanyahu, look, we have always been proud of the contributions that Israel has made to the world, whether it's through medicine or through science. And I think it was a, it's a little manipulative to focus solely on that. I don't think one, I don't think it's Sinai versus Auschwitz, and I don't think, I think we have to be conscious as Jews that there are those who are still out there in Europe and in the Muslim world. It is unquestionably manipulative on my part to show a clip like that, although I'll say in my defense, I didn't edit any of it. <laughs> Right, that's the speech. I stopped at a certain point and it's on YouTube, so you can watch the rest of it. I want to be clear. There is no relationship between what I'm talking about today and the, my belief in the Israeli defense establishment and its sense of responsibility of what it means to preserve, protect, and defend the state of Israel. Right? It is simply a question of whether that narrative of preserving and protecting and defending the state of Israel becomes the dominant metaphor through which we envision what the state of Israel is supposed to be. That's what we're talking about. Is the state of Israel primarily meant to preserve, protect, and defend Jews in Israel and around the world, which is one story, or is the state of Israel meant to be something different? And I do, what I stand on is that even though this is a manipulated, manipulated chosen clip for this purpose, I do think it, re, I think it represents an instinct in, in the current Israeli political climate, as well as in Jewish sensibilities of what then, what, what, to what standard do we hold the Jewish people in the state of Israel in thinking about whether it's living up to its covenantal obligations? Yeah, Eric. Um, I'm going to take one more afterwards, and then I'm going to ask you to hold them, and we'll come have another round. Yeah. So Ruth Calderon's statement is, is amazing, uh, but you left out the last sentence right after she ends, which is really the most amazing part, and I think really significant to David Hartman. It's no longer enough to leave the bait this scratch as you entered it. You also have to add a small prayer for her political party to maintain the unique culture and cooperation, brothers remain united and remain in the plenum. She's almost creating political uh, survival as an element of holiness. 
And it seems to me that this is really almost Hartman's unique notion uh, that the halakha in Israel is going to be very different than the halakha in, in exile. Um, and it, it, for a woman with her sensibility, to end with the prayer for political survival of her party, not of the country, <laughs> is a pretty remarkable statement. That's right. In other words, this model of Sinai has to actually be mediated through a political process. Right? And that's, that's why it's useful that she's a Haver Knesset. That it's not just a vision of David Hartman writing in English in this Beit Midrash in 1982, but it's actually being expressed through a kind of realpolitik of if you want to actually create Sinai, you have to move it from being the provenance of, um, of uh, Jewish theology to real politics. And it's actually, that's a little bit of what Micha and I were talking about on Saturday night, right? Of how do you, Take, um, take this model and turn it into something that actually animates a political system. And that's when I, when I remember when I asked him the question of, um, of David Hartman's legacy, right? What his answer was, how do you take those ideas that couldn't be heard by Israelis in English and with so much anger and from outside the system, how do you translate it into an idiom that actually can be heard and can be effective? And that's why it's not just the Micha Goodmans who are the representatives of this, but Ruth Calderon is a representative of it. She may not, she, she only claims it a little bit, but she is, a, she is tra essentially translating into political terms what it means to embody this Sinai consciousness. Um, yes, Sissy, last one. Look, I, I think part of the reason of talking about this today and presenting this is I think this is still a ripe and unresolved internal tension that many of us feel as Jews and as Zionists about the state of Israel. In other words, what, in, in which side of the state of Israel are we in relationship to? And I think part of the anxieties, and this is a much longer conversation, of Jews having these conversations with Christians is that we are not always sure which side of these sensibilities are we supposed to articulate out loud to others. It's like it's one conversation for Jews to have of are we meant to be having a conversation about Israel as an aspirational society or are we meant to have a conversation about Israel as survival? That already tears apart the Jewish community internally, right? If my aspiration becomes a means by which someone else will attack me for not being sufficiently loyal to the survival challenges of the state of Israel and that becomes magnified when you start to introduce um, Christians, Muslims and others, right? Where if you're not, you know, the anxiety of what you think the state of Israel is invites an anxiety vis-a-vis -vis the others. I want to explain what your party is and how it relates to Naftali Bennett since I'm not going to answer that right now. Okay. Okay. It's important. Maybe. <laughs> What's that? A little context would be helpful for us. I am an, I want to just say clearly I'm an American Jew. <laughs> I don't vote in Israeli elections. I, therefore, I think it would be disingenuous to identify with a particular po political party. What to me this is, first and foremost, not a political conversation, it is a Jewish conversation. And that's why, as even if we start with Auschwitz, we look at Esav Sonei Yaakov. That's why when we start at Sinai, we look at the revelation at Sinai. Because I think that Jewish conversation implicitly and sometimes explicitly manifests in political ideologies that actually run deep into our Jewish consciousness. What I'd like to do next is I want to punch some holes, 
right? Why, even though I like the Ruth Calderon speech, why the image of the revelation at Sinai doesn't work? And even though I identify with both Wes and Eleanor's comments about the need for a Jewish survival instinct, that too doesn't work, although I think it's a little bit more self-evident and it was on display last night. Two texts from Exodus which suggest that the, the model of Har Sinai as fundamentally a problematic model to imagine Jewish sovereignty, um, which to me are mirrored by my experience studying in yeshiva here in Israel. I studied in yeshiva that was on a mountain, and that was a it was the perfect metaphor for the heads of my yeshiva to imagine what how great the yeshiva was. They always talked about how wonderful this kind of yeshiva on a hill was, that this was the perfect place in which Judaism could be lived out in its fullness. And it wasn't until I actually literally and metaphorically came down from the mountain that I realized the perversion that can be implied when you imagine that the mountain of Revelation is actually the site of where Judaism really happens. It's a retreat. And this is expressed in unbelievable, the unbelievable critique of Sinai is in the Bible itself. Right after the revelation in Trans Sinai transpires, look at page 19. And all of the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings <clears throat> and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were shaken and stood far away. And they said to Moses, speak with us and we will hear, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said, fear not, the Lord has come to test you and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. They say we can't speak to God directly because it's terrifying, it's overwhelming, and we don't want to be in that kind of intimate relationship with God on top of the mountain. Moses says, don't worry, but what's the result? And the people stood far away and Moses went near into the darkness where God was. They actually retreat from the mountain. The people actually can't live at Sinai. Sin if Sinai becomes the paradigm of the society we want to create, even though it is not actually livable and inhabitable by the people of Israel. They become so terrified by this moment of revelation, or put in more prosaic terms, they become so terrified by aspiration and covenant that they actually almost instinctively drift away, which becomes played out even further 12 chapters later on page 20. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Arise and make us a god which will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who has brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what be has become of him. This becomes the story of the golden calf. One of the most astonishing pieces of the Bible story is that if Sinai is supposed to be as great as Sinai is, how is it that immediately after the revelation of Sinai, the people deteriorate so quickly and retreat into a golden calf? Maybe modeling Jewish sovereignty and around the aspiration of Sinai sets up an unlivable paradigm. Right, where we're putting ourselves into a moment of revelation that not only is not translatable once you come down the mountain, but actually is ironically sets you back further because it creates a standard by which you can't fundamentally live up to that the people, upon seeing that Moses doesn't return to them, their first instinct is to build a golden calf and to actually betray that covenant. The Sin Sinai is unbelievably horrific pedagogy. The revelation at Sinai is horrific pedagogy. Because if it's modeling the moment of this divine canopy of relationship between God and the Jewish people, how is it that it falls apart and deteriorates so quickly? God says in verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Right? And then God's instinct in the next few verses is to destroy them. Because if the whole model was to actually be in relationship at Sinai, it is unlivable. Much as I realized you can't live up on the mountain in the yeshiva. It can't, that's not real life. That's why God says explicitly to the people of Israel after Sinai, go back to your tents. Which the rabbis interpret as Sinai is fine for setting out an agenda, but it is not a model to actually live out Judaism. What's even more explicit is, and we'll look a little bit more closely here at verse on page 22, source 13. The Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. He wrote upon the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So Moses is in this kind of erotic uniting with God on Mount Sinai, where it's only the two of them and no longer the people of Israel. And what are the people of Israel doing while Moses is up here on the mountain? 
either sinning, depending on when this takes place in the story, or recovering from a massacre that God had undertaken because they had sinned. <laughs> so now Moses is back up on the mountain, convening in relationship with God, and what does he have to trade in order to be in relationship with God? His fundamental humanity. He neither eats nor drinks. This is not a human moment on Mount Sinai. Sinai is, can't be the model by which you imagine aspiration and sovereignty when it is fundamentally dehumanized by the fact that he's neither eating nor drinking. And then he comes down from the mountain with the two tables of testimony, and he walked down from the mount. Moses knew not that the skin of his face shone when he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the people saw Moses, um, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were all afraid to come closer to him. And what does Moses have to do in verse 33? When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. When Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spoke to the people of Israel, which he was, he was commanded. And the people of Israel saw the face of Moses, that his face shone. So he put the veil back on until he went in to speak with God. Moses, the one person who actually lives up on the mountain, who's actually the exemplar of Sinai, can't actually any longer be in relationship to other human beings. His whole existential condition changes by virtue of the fact that he's on Mount Sinai. The story of the outcome of Mount Sinai is, um, is devastating. I, I, I've, we've set up, and David Hartman sets up this model, that Sinai is the place in which the Jewish people enter into a covenantal relationship with God, the place where we're able to articulate our aspirations, where we talk about the society we want to build, and then we go into land of Israel, it's all perfect. And the next 15 chapters consist of an intra-biblical intra critique of Sinai itself where it is unlivable on top of the mountain. The people are fleeing from the mountain because they are terrified of it. The minute that they no longer hear Moses atop the mountain, they sacrifice a gold, they create a golden calf and they worship it. They replace the aspiration that Moses had wanted them to have with God with something they can actually live out in real life. The, then Moses himself can no longer communicate with the people of Israel and a veil has to come down over his face. If anything, much of the rest of the book of Exodus is basically saying Sinai doesn't work. Right? Sinai doesn't work. You want to have a real version of a covenant, do it in a way that the people are not terrified, that the people don't actually instinctively run away and create a golden calf, and that it doesn't actually alter the physical condition of Moses in such a way that he can no longer be in relationship to the people. The mountain, when we think about the mountain, we actually wind up creating this troubling, hierarchical, dysfunctional relationship between God and the people of Israel in which they feel, as a result, no sense of loyalty to that covenant. If this was a story of loyalty to the covenant that, that could actually animate the building of a state, or could actually animate Jewish sovereignty, how is it that they emerge from Sinai with what seems to be no loyalty to the revelation at Sinai itself? Now, what's the reverse? What's the problematic of Auschwitz? Look at the Gemara on page, um, on page 26. The, problema the problematic of Auschwitz, um, oh wait, let me say one more thing about Sinai, I'm sorry. Um, how does the Torah end? Do the people actually get to build a Jewish society in the land of Israel? Deuteronomy winds up setting up so many conditions on how it is that the, the land is, um, is supposed to, uh, how it is that we're supposed to live out our promise in the land, that it almost becomes impossible to imagine that they're ever gonna actually be able to go into the land of Israel. Sinai not only creates a barrier between the people and the, the vision and, and, and the vision that God's wanting to create, but all of those commandments make it almost impossible for the Jewish people to live up to what God had wanted them to do in the land of Israel. So much so, and this is always surprising, the Torah ends before they get into the land of Israel, as if to say, you're never going to be able to do it in the way that Sinai wants you to do it. What's very difficult about Sinai is that the risk of Sinai as a paradigm for Jewish sovereignty is that it makes you unwilling or unable to ever feel actually that you're doing it. Sounds like St. Paul. I'll, I'll take that question in a second. But it almost is like if you live up to the standard of Sinai, you're never going to do it. You can never have a Jewish state that uses as its operative metaphor a revelation, essentially a failed revelation that devastates and distances the people and that sets up so many rules and parameters, you'll never be happy in the state that you actually create. 
The language of aspiration, even though it's compelling and exciting, it's almost you say to Ruth Calderon, well, what if you were only able to do one-tenth of your legislative agenda, right? Is it still worth it? Is it worth it to have a state, if it's governed by this divine human relationship and this covenant, is it worth it to have it if we're never going to live up to it? And if we're putting ourselves in a framework, in a model, in which that we're almost um, inclining ourselves to failure? It's one of the interesting, bizarre moments of the current state of Israel, right? Which is that um, Zionism until 1948 meant a kind of collaborative Jewish conversation about what it is that we're going to be able to do when we have a state together. That's what Zionism was. Cultural Zionists, political Zionists, and there are people in this room who know a lot more about this than I. It was a conversation about aspiration. It was a Sinai conversation. And then 1948 comes along, and Zionism becomes now an act of loyalty to the state we currently have, and shortchanges the aspiration conversation. Because to talk in aspiration when you already have a real state is almost to say, I kind of wish we had a different one. This is the paradox that Sinai actually creates. When you create a paradigm of, of in, that's entirely in the framework of aspiration, it makes you never satisfied or never capable of feeling dayenu, the state itself, is enough. The critique of Auschwitz I want to look at in the Talmud is this really um, remarkable, um, remarkable Gemara that gets been picked up by Maimonides, where the Gemara says as follows, and Rabbi Judah said, citing Rav, whoever indulges in grief, we're on page 26, 26, page 26, whoever indulges in grief to excess over his dead will weep for another. If you grieve too much for your loss, this is like this ominous, devastating comment. If you weep and grieve too much for those who you've lost, you will come to weep and grieve for another. Now unpack that shortly. There was a certain woman that lived in the neighborhood of Rav Huna. She had seven sons, one of whom died, and she wept for him rather excessively. Um, Rabbi Huna sent word to her saying, don't do that. <laughs> Stop. You can't mourn so much for this loss. She heeded him not, and he said to her, If you need my word, it is well, but if not, are you anxious to make yet another provision for yet another? If, I'm sorry, it should be, if you heed my word, it is well, not need. If you listen to me, you'll be better. If not, if you continue to mourn, are you prepared for the possibility you will lose another son? The next son died, and they all died. In the end, he said to her, Are you making preparations for yourselves? And she died. What's this Gemara doing? <laughs> so it's a devastating Gemara, right? <coughs> People don't like this Gemara, I can sense, right? <laughs> I think what the Gemara is trying to suggest is that if you live in a culture that venerates death, you invite death. You forfeit life when you entirely become obsessed with death. Do we have to believe the metaphysics of a story that one died and then since she didn't, um, she mourned him too much that the second son died? The metaphor of the story is that when you entirely live in veneration of death, in a, total lack, in a total life of mourning, you have essentially forfeited the value of life as being meaningful. You have to locate your mourning in a particular place at a particular time. And I, I want to say um, with both reverence and fear that we have an absolute cult of Jewish death. Which, has been, which is pervasive in the Jewish community in the amount of buildings, investment, and, um, and um, just overwhelming uh, preponderance of Holocaust <clears throat> as part of contemporary Jewish consciousness in a way that makes us as though if we, and, and the, even the language of if we forget, if, if the survivors are no longer here, who is going to remember us? Right? Makes it as though it is more important for us as Jews to be in a conversation about what we've lost more than a conversation about who we are. I think this, this Gemara in Moed Katan sounds like a basic fear and distrust of a paradigm of Auschwitz. And Wes, to your comment, I can be fearful of contemporary um, threats that are being set against me without being obsessed with either my, my current possibility of death or my past possibility of death. This text imagines that when you become so locked into a culture of mourning, you actually are not building your own institutions and you're not building life. 
it would be interesting to track how much money in the Jewish community, and money is, you know, was a thread of last night, how much money in the Jewish community goes into Holocaust memorial buildings and how much money in the Jewish community goes into Jewish education and to other mechanisms of Jewish renewal and survival. It's not even close, right? Because we have an obsession as a Jewish community with the notion that Auschwitz, or metaphorically the entire Holocaust, are a defining story that if we don't invest in preserving the story of death and survival, we're not actually preserving the Jewish people. The Gemara of Rav Huna is, if you become entirely obsessed with it, you've essentially forfeited the opportunity of what it is you're actually going to do with your life. The Rambam plays this out on the top of page 27 in, in technical halachic terms, but he actually cites this piece of Talmud. One should not cry over the deceased for more than three days, and one should not eulogize them for more than seven. When does the above apply to people at large? With regard to Torah scholars, of course, everything depends on the wisdom of the Torah scholars. But in any case, we don't cry for them for more than 30 days, for we have no one greater than Moses, our teacher. And concerning him, Deuteronomy says, they only wept for him for 30 days. Even further, we do not eulogize for more than 12 months, for we have no one of greater wisdom than our only teacher, and he was eulogized for only 12 months. Similarly, if a report of a wise man's death reaches us after 12 months, we do not eulogize him. Even if, in other words, there's, this is not simply that I set a time limitation on how long I'm allowed to mourn, but the time limitation is intrinsic. If I only found out of a person's death after 12 months, I'm not allowed to eulogize that person anymore. It's something that actually hurts our human condition when we obsess with eulogy at the cost of actually moving on. It goes further. A person should not become excessively brokenhearted because of a person's death. As Jeremiah states, do not weep for a dead man and do not shake your head because of him. That means to not weep excessively, for death is the pattern of the world. And a person who causes himself grief because of the pattern of the world is a fool. And the Rambam's kind of worked up. <laughs> a person who becomes obsessed with loss, when that is actually the nature of the world itself, has actually his language of foolishness is forfeited his sense of what it is to actually live in the rest of the patterns of the world. And a person who causes himself grief because the pattern is a fool, what should one do? Weep for three days, eulogize for seven, and observe the restrictions on cutting one's hair and the other five matters for 30 days. There are rules, there are patterns, and there are systems for how people are supposed to mourn their loss, and it is not supposed to exceed that. And thinking that you're supposed to add an emotional layer to what it is that you're supposed to do to mourn winds up compromising the life that you're supposed to lead. The Rambam finally says, and this will be the transition to what it means to create a legitimate culture of memory in a community that is still a community of aspiration, he says, whoever does not mourn over his dead in, which the ma sages, in the manner with which our sages commanded is cruel. Instead, one should be fearful, worry, examine his deeds, and repent. Don't think that because the Rambam until this point has been saying, if you mourn too much, right, that therefore I'm supposed to cut down on my mourning. Right? It's one thing, the, the two extremes that Maimonides is setting up are foolishness and cruelty. Cruelty is the unwillingness to pause, repent, reflect, and mourn for your loss. Foolishness is an obsession with it. It's when you turn something from being a cult, uh, from being a, a proper performance to a cult of death. This is the moment, right? How do you, how do we, as a community, imagine the relationship then between Auschwitz as a feature of a Jewish consciousness, which gives the right space for the mourning that winds up not only being the ritual we do to commemorate the death, but also becoming animating narrative in Jewish history. And at the same time, in other words, we can't be cruel to that memory. And at the same time, not allow it to become so overwhelming that we are fools. I want to share a few texts that I think help us do this, right? Of what it will mean to try to hold on as a community to a real sense of non-cruel memory, right? That actually animates our consciousness, but doesn't allow it to become um, obsessive. The amazing text in Gemara Baba Batra, um, on page 28, where the rabbis say, in the second paragraph, our rabbis taught. To me, this is, uh, to me, when I think about Jewish memory texts, this is perhaps the most important. 
Our rabbis taught, a man should stuck, uh, I'm sorry, the next rabbis taught, three lines down. Our rabbis taught, when the temple was destroyed for the second time, a large numbers in Israel, numbers of Jews became ascetics, binding themselves neither to eat meat nor to drink wine. Why would somebody make a move like this to neither eat meat or drink wine in the face of this type of destruction? Right. Either to avoid celebration, that's perhaps the most you know, generous reading of them. I want to avoid that this happens. Or to essentially say, what is life worth living in the wake of this kind of loss? How can I possibly celebrate? How can I go on living as a Jew? Which was one of the post-Holocaust Jewish instincts. Right? Of what does it mean to go on living as a Jew in the wake of this, ca this cat catastrophic loss? What does it mean to be governed by ideals and values in a moment like this? Rabbi Joshua got into conversation with them and said to them, my sons, why do you not eat meat nor drink wine? They replied, can we eat flesh which used to be brought as an offering on the altar now that the altar is in abeyance? How could, we, it's an obscenity to eat meat. Meat used to be what was sacrificed in the temple and now there's no longer a temple. Shall we drink wine which used to be poured as a libation on the altar but no longer? It's an obscenity to drink wine. How could you go on Jewishly when all of the, the sights of what you did, how could you even eat and drink when this is actually, the temple has actually been destroyed? He said to them, if that is so, we should not eat bread either because the meal offerings have ceased. <laughs> they said, and I love this line, that's okay, we'll eat fruit. <laughs> Right? Um, if we're going to start, this, obviously this is a reductio ad absurdum, right? If we're going to start with the bread and with meat, well, everything is connected with the temple, right? Everything, all, whole Jewish life was manifested in Eastern Europe. If I start, if I, if I eliminate what it means to live in the present because of a sense of loss in the past, I, I radic I, I'm going to very quickly fall down a slippery slope of doing nothing in the present because everything was in the past. He said, he said, we shouldn't eat fruit either because there's no offering, no longer an, um, a first fruits. They said, okay, we'll manage with other fruits. They said, we should not drink water because there's no longer a ceremony of the pouring of water. And to this, they could find no answer. Right? Ultimately, the reduction is the last thing, the elements of human survival are things you can't fundamentally get rid of. And he says to them, my sons, come and listen to me. Not to mourn at all is impossible because the blow has fallen. To eliminate the culture of mourning is, is, as Maimonides says, cruel. This happened to us. It must be mourned. Um, but it goes one step further. To mourn over much is also impossible because we do not impose on the community a hardship with the majority with which the majority cannot endure. Why don't we mourn too much? We can't do it. Because the people, now, I want to just unpack the sentence. We don't over mourn too much because we don't impose something on the people that they can't endure. What happens if you impose something on the people they can't endure? They either collapse or, like Sinai, they rebel against you and they don't do it at all. Both of those instincts are in that line. If I, if I as a rabbi, tell my congregation not to do something that they know that they won't, that they won't be able to listen to, either they will really revere me <laughs> take it seriously and do something that they hate, or more likely they will rebel against me and I will not have been able to convey the message that I wanted to convey. Instead, what do we do? Um, go on the next line. The sages therefore have ordained thus. A man should stucco his house but leave a little bit bare. Go down after the, par the, par the parentheses. A man can prepare a full course banquet but he should leave out an item or two. A woman can put on all of her ornaments but leave off one or two. Right, for so it says, if I forget thee, Jerusalem, um, let my tongue, my right hand forget, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I remember thee not, if I prefer not Jerusalem over my chief joy. And then go down even um, a few lines further, whoever mourns for Zion will be privileged to behold her joy, as it says, rejoice with Jerusalem. Right? How do you create small scale ritual that, it can, that is, it's, there's a perversity to it, right? like not having an eight, instead of having an eight course meal, I'm gonna have a seven course meal, and I'm gonna call that mourning for the temple. Right, not, you know, stuccoing my house but leaving a corner bare, and that's supposed to be a significant memorial. What the rabbis are doing is saying, what are the rituals of memory that a community can undertake that are the means by which you preserve the value of the past, but you actually move beyond it? They are supposed to be banal. That's why this is, you know, this is the source for why we break a glass at a wedding. 
Right? You're supposed to have this little banal moment of remembering the destruction of the temple, remembering a sense of loss. And I always find it interesting. I've been at a lot of weddings where the rabbis will change the order. It might have even been our wedding. Um, the rabbis will um, change the order of the breaking of the glass to make sure that people know that it's really supposed to be sad because well, the way it plays out now is you break the glass, <laughs> And everybody yells Mazel Tov. And it's basically like, um, it's like a timing mechanism. <laughs> it serves primarily as a timing mechanism so everyone can say Mazel Tov at the same time. So I've had rabbis who've said, no, no, it's not supposed to be a timing mechanism. It's supposed to be sad. Even though most time it's not actually a glass, it's a light bulb, <laughs> right? It's supposed to be sad. But I think, the, I think this text is OK with it not being that sad. I think it's supposed to be ritualistic and not sad. So how do you, what are the mechanisms by which you take a, devasta a devastating loss and actually make it a little bit banal, but significant enough that I know I've done something to, me to be a marker of loss? What does it mean for a Jewish society in the present to not be obsessed with the Holocaust, but to be creating small scale ritual markers that we say, I've acknowledged this loss, I can't go on without acknowledging the loss, but I actually need to do something fundamentally different. The um, Mishnah Ta'anid on the next page um, plays this out even further. On the ninth of Av, is the fourth, li fourth line in, um, it says that five things, five misfortunes befell our forefathers on the 17th of Tammuz, and five bad things happened to us on the 9th of Av. 17th of Tammuz was last week, the 9th of Av is in a week and a half, so this is timely. Right? Go to the 9th of Av. On the 9th of Av, it was decreed that our forefathers not enter the promised land. The temple was destroyed the first time, the temple was destroyed the second time, Betar was captured, and the city of Jerusalem was plowed up. Is it at all historically likely that all five of these things happened on the ninth of Av. What are the rabbis, rabbis doing something amazing here? It's actually, a, John Levinson at Harvard has this a very, he teaches a class called the Jewish Liturgical Year. And one of the key points he tries to make is, you can't have celebrations in a year if you're not willing to acknowledge dark moments. That the Jewish liturgical year is made up by peaks and valleys. This is the darkest moment of the year. And what the rabbis did, to their unbelievable credit, was they said, if we're going to mark tragedies on the Jewish calendar, the whole year is going to be tragedies. <laughs> Right? The whole year is going to be tragedies. This was part of the debate in the state of Israel about whether there should be a separate Yom HaShoah, a separate Holocaust Memorial Day. The Haredim, who then didn't have the political power they had today, resisted it, and they don't observe Holocaust Memorial Day. Because they said, we have days already in the Jewish calendar. How often are you going to actually wind up adding more days? If you did that, why not add one for the Jews of the Crusades? Why not add one for the Jews of, I don't know, Hebron in 1929? What other days are you going to add in the Jewish calendar where your whole year will be spent in mourning? And on this one, I think the Haredim were right. If you actually have days on the Jewish calendar, are your opportunities to engage in blackness? Because if you don't do it on that day, A, it will be over the course of the year. Right, you'll wind up having every day as blackness. And B, if you don't actually give blackness its space, you're cruel. You have to, Ninth of Ab should be something that we as a Jewish people take seriously as the day of catastrophe, precisely so that not every day in our life becomes the Ninth of Av. Finally, um, two last points. The other, two last points. Deuteronomy, Leviticus, throughout the Torah, we are conditioned to think about the relationship between catastrophe and our own behavior in ways that define sovereignty. Perhaps the best example of this is in um, Leviticus on page 32. If a stranger lives with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. But the stranger who lives with you shall be as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. The other way in which the Bible inclines us to think about the relationship between our oppressive past and our progressive future is one of social responsibility. First idea that I tried to lay out between the Gemara and the Mishnah was that we have to find places of blackness in order for blackness not to be the governing myth and metaphor of the Jewish people. But the second thing we have to do is we have to make that darkness work. We have to find ways in order to take the lessons of our own persecution and suffering as a mechanism to impel what it is that we want to make in sovereignty. And there's so many. 
choose your own adventure. What do we have from Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? How many times does the Torah tell us over and over again, since you were a slave in the land of Egypt, that, not, that doesn't simply allow you to be free in the land of Israel. Since you Jewish people were oppressed in Auschwitz, that does not simply license you to become free in the land of Israel, but it creates a sense of responsibility for what that Israel actually consists of. This is the embedding of Auschwitz in a, in a, in a, in a, in a proactive um, context. Finally, um, the last text I'll read, Amos O's, which also cushions this, right? The last text I'll read is from Amos O's, which cushions as follows. Amos O's has an amazing book called Povisham Be'eretz Yisrael, um, here, um, In the Land of Israel, where he says something which also gives the necessary context for what it means to both retain a sense of an Auschwitz consciousness, a legitimacy of the right of the ethics of survival, even if it is not enough for that to be the full destiny of the Jewish people. And it's actually a very surprising piece from O's given his own political leanings. Amos Oz says as follows, this is the place to make my first shocking confession, others will follow. I think that the nation state is a tool, an instrument that is necessary for a return to Zion, but I am not enamored of this instrument. The idea of the nation state is in my eyes goyim nachis, a nation, uh, the, the Gentiles delight. I'd be more than happy to live in a world composed of dozens of civilizations, each developing in accordance with its own internal rhythm, all cross-pollinating one another without anyone emerging as a nation state. No flag, no emblem, no passport, no anthem, no nothing. Only spiritual civilizations tied somehow to their lands without the tools of statehood and without the instruments of war. Like, I'm happy, I would love to live as an aspirational Jewish society, right? We're connected to our land, we build our society, we don't need any of this chazerai of a, a flag and an anthem and all these tools of statehood which he says I'm not enamored by. And here he echoes the, the Sinai move. <laughs> Is this supposed to be about covenant and not about these mechanics, these kind of um, reduced mechanics of state building? But the Jewish people has already staged a long running one man show of that sort. The international audience sometimes applauded, sometimes threw stones, and occasionally slaughtered the actor. No one joined us, no one copied the model. The Jews were forced to sustain for 2,000 years the model of a civilization without the tools of statehood. For me, this drama ended with the murder of Europe's Jews by Hitler. And I am forced to take it upon myself to play the game of nations with all the tools of statehood, even though it causes me to feel, as George Steiner put it, like an old man in a kindergarten. It's an unbelievable image that the Jewish people playing out a life in a state and with all of these games and a, and a parliament when we have this richness of a Jewish tradition when we have this aspirational idea of what our state is supposed to be, we're like an old man in a kindergarten. To play the game with an emblem and a flag and a passport and an army and even war provided such war is absolute existential necessity. I accept these rules of the game because existence um, without the tools of statehood is a matter of mortal danger, not moral, but mortal danger, but I accept them only up to this point. To take pride in these tools of statehood, to worship these toys, to crow about them, not I. If we must maintain these tools, including the instruments of death, it must be not only with glee, but with wisdom as well. I would say with no glee at all, only with wisdom and with caution. Nationalism itself is, in my eyes, the curse of mankind. Oz provides a reminder that a belief in being an aspirational society requires a consciousness of the stakes. I wasn't there for it, but I heard in one of his last talks before he passed away, David Hartman indicated that he felt a retreat from Auschwitz or Sinai. He felt that he didn't give Auschwitz enough oomph. It's really interesting, 30 years on. I think this is part of why. You can't talk constantly about a language of aspiration without a consciousness of the stakes of Jewish vulnerability and loss throughout history. And at the same, you know, it, it would be a perverse take on the state of Israel to, to, to talk about statehood only in a language of aspiration if we know what the absence of a state has actually cost the Jewish people. But at the same time, as we saw in the Talmud, as you see in Maimonides, we can't allow the dominant narrative of what that state is about to be governed by blackness. It is, um, it is psychologically limiting and is fundamentally society living. And the big question with which I leave us is what will it mean to build a, a Zionism and a Jewish, a Jewish state and Jewish society that integrates both of these impulses uh, of Auschwitz or Sinai?
lot of the answers to that. I find myself not old, but older in kindergarten. My kindergarten is rabbinical school. I'm in the office of, of as an educator and as a rabbi. And I'm telling you that what I need as a kindergartner is a sense of heart. I need you to show me things on a daily, regular basis from my tradition that can make me proud. I need you to tell me that I'm being good to the environment, not just because that's what a normal human being, human being would do, but that's because that's what my religion tells me to do. And the issue of spending money on hospitals instead of education is something that we dealt with in the 1970s at the GA. We went with Ellie Wiesel and we banged our shoes on the table and we demanded money for Jewish education. And in 1973 or whatever it was that Malo happened, I was sitting in a group of women who were raising money for the Federation. And every single woman in the circle before me said that they were giving money to Israel because Israel was losing its soldiers and its people and the least we could do would, would be to give our money. And all I could say was, God forbid, that we have to spend, depend on, on Israel, on Arabs, to kill Israeli, kill Israeli children in order to get your money. But the money is not what's important. The money is important, but what's more important is the Jewish identity. And without creating positive Jewish members actively on a daily, weekly basis in all aspects of the lives of our children, we're not going to have children with positive Jewish members. And, and yeah, and this, but this is, this is this tension, right? And I, and I, I agree with you. This is not the first. This is not the first moment in which that story is taking place. And I think part of the very my very deliberate need to talk about a, an essay written in 1982 is because I think we live in cycles of history, and I think this has to be a 2013 conversation and not just one of 1982. Donald, if people want to take a, a few minutes, they're welcome to. But I'm happy to stay and answer a few questions. See, uh, maybe maybe you would cover in the press of time. Some of the last two sources didn't really address this. But to me, there's a whole different model that's possible, which is actually understanding that if mourning and Auschwitz can motivate Sinai. In other words, a sense of loss of life creates also a sense of preciousness mm -hmm. of life, not just to survive, but now, actually, you understand the opportunity of what that life could mean. What you right. have the opportunity to do. Right. So, do we have sources that, that actually take Auschwitz and make it aspirational? I think I think that Kamara and Moed Katan does it a little bit by saying, if you mourn too much for this child, you won't be able to to actually celebrate your other children. I mean, that's a little bit, I think, of what's being hinted at in that text, but I'll, I'll look for more. I understand what you're saying. It's more than just Auschwitz motivates me to build my society in a certain way, but it's about the appreciation of life. Yeah. One last question is, can the Auschwitz paradigm also serve as a unification for Kali Israel? When we have a common enemy, we do seem to come together. That's the to me. It's like the worst of all worlds is praying for Auschwitz, no, right? Because it's like, well, we need that. We need to hold out for it because it actually helps um, to unite us. It's just devastating to me, right? This at best we can say that this these external threats maybe that has been a peripheral benefit of it, but the, the consequence has been that I think there's too much of a celebration of that or a need for it, a striving for it. It's like, I, I can't tell you how many emails I got raised, trying to raise money for Jewish organizations when there was the Palestinian unilateral declaration of independence. As though like we needed to stand together in the face of a political reality that nobody really understood and turned out to have not been a particularly big deal. So I'm not, I, I think that is too risky for me to say that what we need as the Jewish people is to hold on to those moments because they actually help hold us together. I'm going to stop because, um, and I'm happy to take a few. Thank you.